good morning, uh, afternoon, evening for everybody who's joining uh, or watching this perhaps at a later date. Uh, thanks for joining in at such a late notice about this webinar. I'm excited about the, the content. We're just able to figure out we got some videos working, so there's some exciting stuff ahead. Um, but uh, before we begin, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to DSIAC for those who aren't familiar, um, and then I'll hand the balance of time over to Wayne for his presentation and then some Q&A. Um, so my name is Brian Benish. Uh, with DSIAC, the Defense System Information Analysis Center. Uh, we are a DOD entity. We um, operate under DTIC, the Defense Technical Information Center, to support the DOD's research and engineering community. And what we do is we conduct information research on a variety of technical topics. Uh, we have technical folks on staff who are here to help you, as the members of the DOD research and engineering community, help you find the information that you need or any um, defense system technical topic uh, of interest. And so we host a variety of webinars to help ultimately push out an awareness of information on work that's being done throughout the DoD research engineering community or things that are relevant to that community um, to help foster some collaboration um, and help just maybe create that awareness such that there's not repeat work being done. Um, a lot of the great outcomes of these are uh, organization that might hear of, of the webinar topic and say, I didn't know that they were doing that. I'd love to talk and, and see how we can collaborate. So um, that's one of our goals for this uh, these webinar series we do. Um, in terms of logistics of these we the webinar uh, platform that you're in, we have some folks who are dialed in by phone and that's great. Um, if you are, I would encourage you to make sure you go to our website um, and find this webinar uh, webpage. And there you'll find a link to download the slides so you can follow along with them. Um, while you're listening to the audio over the phone, uh, for those who are, are in the web platform, uh, what you can, what you'll see, the most important relevant thing you'll you want to uh, direct yourself to is a little icon that looks like a chat icon in the top middle of the screen uh, for audience questions. So at any time during the presentation, if you want to submit a question, that is where you will do. You should do that. Um, I want to distinguish that from the chat um, as much as you can. Refrain yourself. Please don't put your questions in the chat. Use the audience questions uh, portal, kind of, if you will, in the top middle of the screen. And at the end of the presentation, we will um, go through those that Q and A uh, kind of in the order that it was received. So um, please keep an eye on that. And then I guess the last little bit for anybody who does who might experience any technical difficulties throughout this presentation, uh, please just keep in mind that we'll be recording it and and we'll send out information for how you can access it after this. So don't fret if you have any issues. So um, without further ado, let me hand over the balance of the time to Wayne for his presentation. Wayne, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Brian and uh, Sharon, for hosting uh, this presentation. Uh, I uh, have We've done a lot of work here on these materials, and I wanted to get uh, more of this information out to the public and uh, show some actual data and uh, describe uh, these rather... Uh, uh, I guess what we, we would say, uh, not, not well-known materials. Um, we've been working on, let's, oh shoot, let me get moving here. All right, here we go. Um, you know, the, we started working on these materials oh, in the early 2000s, and the, the big push at that time was for safer, greener, energetic materials. And I use the comparison here with uh, an ionic liquid propellant versus hydrazine. Uh, the advantages there of being very green, safe to use, non-toxic, uh, you know, non-carcinogenic, uh, those types of things. And the same thing uh, goes along with uh, toxicity uh, versus conventional propellants. I was actually at Aerojet and part of the groundwater cleanup there that's still ongoing uh, with the perchlorate, perchlorate uh, groundwater contamination and things there. So uh, there's a legacy of... Uh, what we all say is bad actors that are still used in the industry, but we've spent the last about 15 years working on this new green technology. But uh, that didn't come uh, out of nowhere. There was a lot of material that uh, had been done and work that had been preceding us, primarily uh, the work early in the early 70s and that on is ongoing really at uh, Picatinny with uh, their liquid gun propellants. Uh, the same with... Uh, some of the contractors, ATK and uh, Aerojet and 
others that uh, eventually followed on in using this hand oxidizer. But uh, one of the things that got a bad reputation from some accidents early on where uh, incompatibilities of materials were not well recognized. And uh, so, that, that, that there, so there's kind of a mixed old history of hand-based propellants. Um, the first uh, thing that I recognized and got involved with was uh, some alumni from Aerojet broke off and actually created the first two um, electric propellants under the SBIR programs. Art Kazakian and Charles Grix were my mentors and I spun off from them. I licensed one of the propellants from them and uh, began my work uh, and starting DSSP, uh, we created the uh, electric solid propellants and uh, uh, green mono propellants along with uh, the other uh, funding we've gotten here. That uh, SBIR was really leveraged in this case. We, we leveraged our program sticking with the same research topic, but changing between all the agencies that would fund us for a particular application. We had also got venture funding from uh, Incutel, which was very useful, and uh, some commercial funding from uh, Moog and uh, Shell Game Changer. So we've had a mixed variety of funding. So much of this has been done privately as well as uh, under the SBIR program that uh, I really owe my company to now. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. The um, key to these propellants, and I call them ionic uh, propellants, but the key is using hydroxyammonium nitrate. It's a liquid uh, oxidizer that's not well known. It's a high density material. It's over 1.5 in density. Uh, it has a semi-crystalline behavior. And uh, it is a, a tricky oxidizer to use. You do need to know how to stabilize it and, and uh, work with it that, that way. So uh, that is a little bit more difficult uh, to use that way. Uh, as far as the uh, fuel we use uh, for the solid propellants, uh, it's a high molecular weight polyvinyl alcohol with a high degree of crystallinity that allows a longer pot time so we can uh, uh, cure it up, uh, pour it before it just, uh, 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 you know, turns into a solid. Um, one of the nice things about casting with this material, it does pour about like honey, uh, warm honey. And uh, the material that comes out is pretty much near net shape. There, there, there can be a little bit of swelling if it's uh, not uh, cast correctly, but uh, pretty much near net shape uh, coming out of the, the uh, cast there. And then, uh, yeah, and then the materials become, they are electric. So we'll talk about that as we move along here. Electric materials, in, in this case, we're calling these pyroelectric materials. Everybody is familiar with piezoelectric uh, things. So everybody's got seen the lighters. You, you probably pressure an electrical charge results and uh, you can light your um, you know, fireplace or something like that. In this case, we apply electrical power to a solid material and it causes combustion. There's a, a lot of theory, a lot of uh, things we've done with that, and that's a whole separate topic. But there, we do understand the mechanism of uh, how this heats up and uh, causes a kinetic uh, reaction, um, the kinetics to increase and actually cause combustion. Um, let's see. The basic design of one of our thrusters and to uh, tap into the electrical power is to use basically a coaxial design where we have a central electrode that's insulated, an outer electrode that's, that is the case that's uninsulated. And uh, in this case, we use the outer, outer electrode is positive, the inner electrode is negative. And uh, we get flame spreading across the top of the surface when we ignite the propellant. It burns back the insulation. When we turn off the electrical power, the reaction stops and the uh, propellant goes out. So uh, that burn away insulation has been key to making these multi-fire uh, devices. A device like this can be ignited and re, uh, restarted four or 500 times or more. What you see, what we found over the years too, is that there's a, two different types of burning and, and both of them can be optimized. 
here's an example of just the lower voltage voltage burning where you have a smooth flame you have a, kind of a lazy flame uh, emitted from the surface of the the grain in this case uh, and then when you reach a threshold you get an arc discharge across that surface and you have a plasma formed so the two different types of burning we use primarily on the rocket motor or, or explosives we talk about the chemical burning but when we get into space propulsion we also talk about the uh, plasma combustion of the material and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on the big thing to see with the um, propellant is we have complete extinguishment of this uh, propellant there's no smoldering involved uh, so that we do have basically instant on and off, and that instant on and off is just a couple milliseconds. We've been over the years, we've been able to develop a number of solid propellants through different types of contracts and, uh, and one liquid propellant to uh, go along with the Air Forces. The uh, types of our baseline propellant is called HIPEP, high performance electric propellant. It uh, is well characterized. It's got a shipping classification of uh, 1.4 combustible solid, so very safe that way, and has really been our workhouse horse baseline uh, propellant to, to use. The hot material is another material that uh, we've just never really talked about much, but it's a thermite-like material. We've also been able to get a, a 1.4 shipping classification on it, and uh, it's got some interesting uses for it. It's, it's like a thermite that generates uh, some gas too. Uh, the bad B is a boron-based material that uh, <coughs> has, some, has uh, some interesting uh, characteristics. High PEX, I'll talk about that in uh, more detail as, a, as an explosive form of this material. And then uh, on the liquids, I'll uh, primarily be comparing our gem material to the AFM 315 uh, monopropellant that uh, the Air Force uh, has come up with and we actually manufacture for them. But there's a generalized formulation here. So for those of you interested in the chemistry, there's uh, some uh, uh, information there for you. We'll go on to the next slide here. Um, these are some of the characteristics that we get out of the box. The uh, big thing to look at on the propulsion side is that an uh, uh, ISP performance is right up there with um, composite propellants at 230 to 245 seconds. Uh, we've proven that we can get about 1,000 seconds ISP out of this material as an arc jet, jet in space. Uh, and then uh, the other thing to understand with these propellants is they do not have sustained combustion uh, at under about 200 PSI. So above 200 PSI, it gets tricky to turn them off and on or, or you can throttle. But really when we're talking about the off and on uh, operation of these thrusters, they really are made for low pressure operations at, like I said, less than about 200 PSI. Um, we'll continue on uh, with the... Next slide here. Oh, let's try and see if we get these videos to work right now. Uh, we're we're going to see if this stream will work, and we can uh, see what everybody says. But let's see if this stream will work. Here we go. So what you see here um, is the flexibility of the propellant. Uh, all of these propellants are very uh, damage tolerant. In fact, when we were first trying to cut them, we were using a cheese cutter and the, the propellant would stick back together and we couldn't even separate it. So uh, it, it, it really has that kind of feel of a gummy bear or something like that. Um, here, this uh, just demonstrating, yeah, I hope this stream is working so people can see it, but uh, just demonstrating that is a, an electrode being uh, used to right on top of the propellant. Now you'll see, again, this electrode being put into the propellant, it burning uh, at the surface. And this is something that uh, it, it's maybe not intuitively obvious, but when the material burns away from the electrode, then you've got to keep it in contact with the electrode to keep burning. But 
there is the, just what you can do with this propellant. You can see sticking it together. Here's a, a, a frayed wire on top to, as a bunch of electrodes with the, the grounding plate on the bottom there. So um, that's just some of the odd behaviors we're able to get with this uh, material. Yeah. Yeah, we can stop there, that's about enough. Um, Kim, oh boy, I lost my feed here. Let's see. Should be back, Wayne. Yeah, okay, that, that's back. I, I hope those videos played for everybody. Um, we'll try it again, but uh, we'll continue on. Um, yeah, we'll go back to this, just some of the data on the safety uh, aspects of this material. This is about as safe as you can get. It, it's pretty inert material, like I said, so we've been able to get a, a, a 1.4 shipping classification on it. Some of the more interesting things on these uh, propellants and, and what makes them harder, I guess, to work with is the slope, uh, the, the burn rate slope with pressure is not consistent. Um, what we tried to optimize over the years is the, the kind of plateau burning rate we have in the mid-range between um, about 1,000 uh, PSI and 1,800 PSI, something like that. That range of uh, where it flattens out, we were able to actually run some things. But when you have these very high slopes, it is uh, very difficult to uh, control, and you've got to use some tricky methods to do that. But uh, over the years, we have been able to develop some pretty good uh, uh, burning rate curves there. The other thing for these propellants, again, the electrical behavior, I've talked about where they don't burn under uh, 200 PSI. That's if you don't apply electrical power. Now, using electrical power, you can burn these materials at under 200 PSI. So you have an enhancement. And this enhancement also works for um, high pressure uh, burning of these materials that if you have a burning rate at a particular pressure, say a thousand PSI, by applying electrical power to that propellant at that pressure, we have been able to demonstrate that you can get it to burn up to 10 times faster. So the throttling effect is maintained throughout the um, pressure range. The on and off characteristics of these propellants only operates at under 200 PSI. I mentioned uh, the difference of the arc burning versus the chemical burning. This is a, a, a good example of it just to show uh, the orange uh, uh, is a typical of a of, uh, of uh, chemical burning, the, the, the flame there, and then the purple glow discharge in the high vacuum you can see is, is from the ionization. And so the importance of this slide, and I like to emphasize it and what got me so excited uh, about this is, we really do have a, something here that uh, looks like it's capable of uh, dual mode propulsion, both uh, chemical and electric uh, propulsion. So that, that's always been a teaser with this material. But we go on. Um, we'll go on to the electrical uh, variable explosive EVE. Uh, this was a Air Force uh, SBIR where we took our material, we highly uh, aluminized it, and we formulated it into a, a high explosive. Uh, we were able to maintain the uh, class 1.4C uh, uh, DOT rating on it. Because uh, the material, without being electrical char electrically charged, is rather insensitive. But once you do charge the material up, it will detonate. So um, it's kind of a different beast there. And uh, from the data on the, on the right-hand side here, you can see that the, the propellant is very high performance, too. That uh, we are up there with the best of the... Um, propellants that are be, being used right now, the PBX uh, um, 109 and uh, 
the 795 that uh, we really are uh, a nice performance there. And again, we, we thought that this is a, really a good propellant as far as its damage tolerance or uh, that uh, will re-anneal if it's uh, broken apart. Uh, next slide here. This just gives you some of the, the mechanism there, the, one of the uh, witness plates uh, that you can see the difference there. But uh, basically, in charging the material up, we have void formation, bubbles formed in the material so that when the uh, detonator is applied to it, uh, it will uh, detonate. And you can see the different, uh, difference of the detonation. And again, uh, this is a very high performance material that could be utilized. Now we move on uh, more to focus on the liquid uh, propellants. And I think I do have some more videos here to uh, show you, so we'll jump in there. Okay, yes, we do. So uh, the liquids is, are really where we've been focusing more lately. And uh, we originally developed our GEM monopropellant uh, with funding from uh, Shell Corporation for uh, use in the oil industry, which is a, a long, long road. But uh, and then uh, we that that uh, got us close to um, the Air Force, and uh, we started uh, working with them on on three three fifteen e manufacturing. What I do want uh, we're going to skip this video that's in here. It's not uh, worth breaking us up for right now. But let's uh, move on. This uh, so so what you'll see now is a series of uh, kind of comparisons between. The, the gem monopropellant that we made, the AFM 315E that uh, uh, the Air Force has developed and we also manufacture. And they're different. They're, uh, um, and, and you'll see, they're, they're just, uh, they behave differently. But I'm going to try and show this drop test video now and see if this works. Oh, this flame test. Uh, we're actually we're gonna. This this is a good good one to just show on the the safety. Here's the uh, Gem Mod Three being put in a uh, 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 cap discharge test, and uh, there's no reaction for it there. Uh, the uh, <laughs> you can see we can hold a blowtorch on this material. Uh, this is done in a few minutes, so the kerosene is pulling out. Right uh, you can see just how safe this material is as far as that accidental ignition. It just, it does not, uh, and uh, AFM 315 would do that same thing. So let's see if we get back here. And hey, let me just uh, chime in real quick, Wayne. For everybody who is dialed in and uh, obviously not able to watch the videos, uh, we'll, we will have a compilation of these videos that we'll get from Wayne and, and put them on um, our YouTube channel or somewhere where you can get it. And so we will include that information in a follow-up email. So, you know, no worries if you can't get to it. We'll we'll make sure we can provide a way to access it later on. Yeah, so again, uh, I give a, a baseline formulation here for the SHAN5, which is uh, uh, co-oxidized with ammonium nitrate. And, uh, that uh, I had mentioned that with the, our HAN oxidizer. This is the way we use it. Uh, we we co-oxidize it with, you know, a few percent of uh, ammonium nitrate, and then we have some stabilizers in there as well. Um, and then as well as the uh, uh, gem, gem uh, formulation there as well. Uh, let's see. Here's some data for you on uh, if we look at the characteristics of uh, our gem material in 315 optimized for performance. Um, that's you know kind of where where you see the difference. I will say the, the this uh, is something that we do have a higher flame temperature, so there's not a one to one trade with 315. So these are again have to be designed differently. But one of the things we have uh, been able to do is is start modifying our our uh, gem propellant for different applications outside of space. And so one of the things we've looked at is, is adding different amounts of water to get different uh, combustion characteristics. And you can see uh, how, how the addition of water will uh, decrease the burning rate of uh, our materials and uh, in a controlled fashion and uh, a predictable way. Here's a, a comparison of uh, the AFM 315 uh, Gem Mod 3 in hydrazine. 
you can see uh, kind of the, the reason why uh, everybody wants to move away from hydrazine. It's just the relatively low performance there, the high toxicity. Uh, and so that uh, these new satellite propellants utilizing the higher density liquid uh, monopropellants will really have uh, a lot more performance in them and be a lot safer to use. And uh, I'll let you look, look at the details of that chart. Now we are going to try another video. And this is, again, just some test data for you, but it'll show uh, kind of a comparison or a comparison of uh, the 315 and uh, gem uh, on a hot. This is a catalyst. Oops, this is the wrong one to start with. This is the catalyst video. So you can, this is a drop test with AFM 315 and Jeb Mod 3 on a, on a catalyst. And uh, what you see for our, our 315 is it's a, it tends to react slower with the catalyst than uh, the Mod 3 does. And as, as the Mod 3 or, or gem propellant is burning out, you'll start to see the uh, more of the 315 start to ignite now. You can see more 315 starting to burn. And just a slower burn rate. So again, kind of different performance, but as far as more instant on, I think uh, you know we can we can combust faster that way. Let's uh, continue on. Yeah. So on the right hand side of the slide, you can see uh, the actual graph of what you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This this is the wrong one. You're seeing. <laughs> I apologize for that. We'll, we'll go back here here to uh, this uh, drop test here. So my numbers must be off. But uh, what I was going to try and show you there was uh, a drop test, but uh, it, basically the same same as what you've seen there now. Um, so let's just get back to the presentation. Yeah, what you saw was this catalyst video, the, the different reaction rates there. Now here's some performance data looking at uh, the monopropellants and uh, or liquid propellants that are out there, uh, we can see the differences. And uh, one of the things that was surprising to us that uh, the gem monopropellant can actually outperform uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, hypergolics there. You see the NTO MMH uh, material there. So uh, we look at this as a lot of potential there and the same, same comparison data there that uh, we've been able to uh, improve and uh, use this material. Let's see, here we go to the examples. We were able to fly the first uh, uh, electric mono or electric solid thrusters in 2014 uh, with a program we did with the Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, this was a solar uh, wind experiment, a spin sat. We were able to uh, put a number of uh, thrusters on this. Uh, satellite this, uh, um, and uh, run them. And so we were actually the first uh, hand-based propellant in space. Uh, in 2019, um, NASA and the Air Force uh, um, ran a mission uh, led by Ball Aerospace and uh, Aerojet, and they uh, flew AFM 315 in space. So uh, actually this uh, slide is to let the world know that both uh, Solids and solid and liquid uh, hand-based propellants have now flown in space, which is a, a big step for uh, eventual broader use. And uh, let's see. we took that data and we applied it to a uh, ACS system for for more of uh, uh, an envelope or an interceptor or something like that. And uh, at the end of our program, this is about the data we were able to get out. We're, we're 
this propellant shines is for small impulse uh, ACS, precision ACS. And uh, after a number of you know contracts and things, this is about where we ended up uh, with the uh, performance of these small thrusters. And and our concept for these small thrusters, as you can see there, was really to, to build them up more like electrical components than uh, thrusters typically that you could place these on, on boards and uh, use them because these uh, really are just, you know, micro pulses and not a lot of heat or, um, you know, stress generated on anything. So that's, that's what we were looking at there. Uh, since that time, we've now moved to <coughs> looking at the electric propellants in terms of explosives. And uh, we just completed this test a couple of weeks ago now where we have, we previously demonstrated that we can turn the liquid propellant gem into an explosive by wrapping it with depth cord, and uh, it's a low velocity ex uh, explosive there. What we've recently done now is to add metal material in a separate bag. So what we can do now is have two highly incompatible materials uh, uh, explosively mixed and ignited that way. And uh, in this series of uh, photographs here on the left-hand side, you can see just the pure gem propellant uh, fireball being ignited and uh, burned through there. The, uh, the two uh, images on the, on the right-hand side there, you can see the secondary combustion of the uh, magnesium occur. We're moving on to some other materials too. And it's hard to see, but you can just see the difference in... Uh, the uh, plume uh, that comes off of the material as well. And uh, we, we're still working on the shock waves and things, but we're hoping that we can modify the shock wave to be broader and longer. And the reason we're doing that is uh, underground and to break rocks and, and things like that, you really do have to have a slow shock wave. If you have too high a velocity shock wave, uh, you pulverize the rock, you turn it into powder where if you have a slower shock wave, uh, you can make long, more penetrating fractures. So as we've uh, tried to modify this material to take it into the uh, oil industry, we, we want to get a, a shock wave that's just near supersonic or something like that, uh, not much beyond that, and uh, combine that into a tool. Uh, this this uh, is an example, and this is a, a test, um, some series of test photos showing that the way we're, we're looking at these downhole tools is first we have the initiation of the shape charges there on the top photo photograph where you can see uh, them shooting through the casing and that's followed by the uh, ignition of the propellant that then uses those shape charge generated uh, fractures to enhance them and break the rock more. So this is a new area for liquid propellants. Uh, there are solid propellants and explosives used underground now, but uh, pumpable and injectable. Uh, the big hope here is the injection of this uh, liquid propellant actually into the rock formation and then ignite the material outside of the well bore. That would be a, a, a huge advancement for fracturing rocks um, and uh, stimulating reservoirs. Finally, the, uh, the thing we have done with uh, recently is uh, test these materials, their heaving effect in uh, snow. And so we've taken those same liquid propellants, used the, the low velocity shock wave of it to, uh, to push snow around. And right now emulsion propellants are, are generally used for maritime, this wet, heavy snow. Uh, to move it around. And from the data we've been able to uh, collect it, uh, locally here, that uh, we have been able to show that we have a better shock wave uh, coming out. The issue is uh, the price of the propellant at this point, that uh, the cost of this propellant is, is going to be a lot higher than uh, what the industry is used to. So this may not necessarily be the best application for it, but it does fit in there. The one thing that is, uh, important in the uh, ski industry here. It's incredible how much 1.1 explosives are stored at ski areas. 
And so the safety aspect of, of uh, having smaller setbacks and, and reduced, uh, reduced uh, hazards associated with your 1.1 explosives uh, is something that may eventually go over to the ski industry. But as far as uh, shockwaves and moving snow, we've had some success here and uh, it looks like uh, there's uh, potentially something we can do there. And then uh, the current program we're on and moving forward with is uh, with the Army for using these materials as um, muzzle flash simulators and battlefield effects. And the purpose of that is, is to get rid of the real pyrotechnics and things that can hurt people out there. The, uh, this use, again, uh, would allow, reduce the... Uh, potential injury, uh, reduce training time too. There's a lot of environmental contamination from blank rounds that uh, from uh, the lead primers in there. Uh, also picking up the empty shell casing, things like that, uh, tracking those things. So what we've developed is using our materials as this muzzle flash simulator. The Army seems to like it and is uh, moving forward with us on it. And this is a video I do want to uh, show everybody here. What you'll see is a comparison of this e squib that has been in space, has uh, you know done a lot of different things, used as a special effect, and we've had these uh, these e squibs used as essentially repeatable firecrackers. We've had them in staple centers. They're in a couple large theme parks now, and that's that's really where uh, this commercial uh, product uh, goes to. And uh, so let's pull up this last video. And I hope this is the one. And uh, you'll see that, oh, you see that video, gosh darn it. Uh, oh, where did I go? What's that? Oh, here we go. So there's the east squib firing on a rose. You can see the rose isn't uh, affected by it at all. Obviously, a firecracker takes out the rose pretty quickly. Here's the string of firecrackers being fired. You can see both eyes. Oh, it's so fucking still out. The east squib keeps firing, and uh, we typically say the east squib will have a life of about 400 shots. Here's the uh, application kind of on a string of uh, firecrackers there that what you see there is we can make a string of firecrackers for amusement park or something like that last about 15 minutes. So what that means to the army for training exercises, we can have realistic pop-up targets that are firing back at you um, with a muzzle flash that uh, would, would uh, register with the, uh, you know, a thermal site or anything like that, and uh, be able to leave those targets out in the field for the full duration of the exercise. So this, this uh, you know, might be days at a time or something like that, rather than having to go back and replace every single squib. So uh, just the number of, uh, the, the, the reduction of logistics to do something like that uh, makes this possible. Um, let's see. I think that's, yeah, that's about it. So we're ready for questions, Brian. All right, great, thanks, Wayne, appreciate it. We did get a couple questions came in, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna bring them up here. So if you're able to see the screen, you can see the question. I'll repeat them though, for those who can't see the screen. And then if any time you wanna submit your question, um, top middle of the screen, you, uh, yeah, I, click on review. go ahead. I, I see this one from uh, Travis. Um, that how does a, at constant pressure, it does. It, it, it basically scales linearly to a certain point where it can't be exceeded. But um, I, I don't know how to tell you that, but does the power, oh, I, I, I think I understand your question now. How does the power uh, scale with pressure? Something I can tell you that the amount of power required to use, to uh, throttle, goes down with pressure. So the highest power requirement is at the lower pressures. 
when you get to higher pressures, larger motors or something like that, the amount of power needed to throttle um, is really small in comparison, if that helps. I can, I can off the top of my head, I can remember ignition uh, power required, oh, uh, ambient might be 200 volts or something like that, whereas at 1,000 PSI, it might be six volts, something like that. So um, that I hope that's a generalized question. You're welcome to contact me and we can talk more. Yep. Perfect. All right. Thanks. All right. So next question here. Um, question is, can you provide a comparison between your propellant and the specific impulse of hydrazine or other propellants? And then the follow-up was about specific impulse comparison with others that you have on page 24 of your presentation. I thought it was on there. I, I uh... I think it's in those tables. Am I not um, sure there? Uh, uh, was do, it, you want to switch, do you want to switch back to page 24? Yeah. Can we pop that up and uh, see? Sure. If I'm not showing information, it's, it's not because, uh, let's see, theoretical. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Yeah. It's because the, um, the impulse is on there. I don't, maybe that question came in before this chart came up. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, there, there's the information as, as best we know it. Okay. No, that's good. All right. Let's back, jump back to the questions. Then. Yep. Okay. He said, uh, just he did message us and say, yeah, it's there. ISP was provided. So thanks. The so next oh. question is. Uh, um, again, I'll refer you back to uh, that that lower temperature. We do um, we do have again. I'm I'm going to go use uh, back to the uh, solid propellant, which uh, is a bit easier. We have seen this perform at minus twenty C. Um, what happens when the solid materials are stored at very um, low temperature, they're, they're fired at very low temperature, you de do need more power to uh, essentially activate them that way. So um, in-space storage is, is possible with this, the, the solids there, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but um, it was data. For and then, the, so and right, now, just to just to reiterate the question for those who can't see it, the question is what is the free what is the freezing point? How cold can you store or use it? And then the other end of the spectrum, how hot? Yeah, and I think it's back it's back on that chart. I, I, I apologize, I just don't have these things off the top of my head. Um, but uh, I think it's on that chart there. Do we have yeah boiling point, freezing point? Yeah, all all, all that data's on there for you. So um, yeah, okay. we can move on to the next question. Okay, perfect. Next question is, uh, so what are the ignition thresholds in terms of electric field strength? <laughs> you know what? That's like saying um, it, it depends on the size of the material and uh, everything like that. That uh, what I can tell you, it takes about 200 volts, a half an amp or something like that to get this. What we typically do for the small materials, we'll do a capacitive discharge into the, um, the small grain there. Uh, how you use that electrical power, the field strength, again, it, it's all dependent on the size of the, the actual uh, grain. So I don't know, if, again, if that answers your, your question. We have a, a voltage threshold of about 200 volts. And then mm -hmm. it's a time delay that comes beyond that, that if you want that, say if you're, you're at 200 volts and you're, you're just, just at a few millivolts, it may take you know an hour to get something to happen. If uh, you kick that up to you know half an amp or something like that, boom, you're gonna get an immediate reaction. So it's, it's something on the kinetics that you want to, how, how much power you crank into these things. I hope that mm -hmm. helps. Okay, no, that's good. Um, next question is, can AC fields ignite these materials? Oh, boy, that, that was almost a, a setup question. I love that <laughs> question. Uh, yes. In fact, that was 
when I originally split off from uh, ET Material, Art and Charlie, um, they were using AC fields with the original material, which worked fine because it was the kinetics were so slow, it didn't even know it was AC uh, voltage. The high pep material that I took off and, and started running with, the, the thing that impressed me with high pep is you could hear the AC current going through it. So you can hear 60 cycles in uh, the high pep propellant when you use AC. Uh, we haven't used it much, but yeah, absolutely. AC fields work and uh, they're probably an area we, we should probably re-examine again. Thanks for that question. <laughs> uh, oh, and I said the other thing nice with the AC field is since you have the electrodes uh, alternating back and forth, uh, you don't have pro uh, progressive burning on one electrode versus the other, you know, it kind of evens it out. So yeah, that's a great question, John. Okay. All right, the next question is, how does the propellant perform with added metal? Well, I gave you some data there on the uh, bad B uh, material, which is the metalized one uh, that we've made. Boron was not reactive uh, with the uh, oxidizer. Aluminum tends to, aluminum's hard to stabilize within this material. So um, that is an issue. But again, I refer you back to the, the boron and we do get uh, 10 or 15 second impulse seconds more. Uh, the addition mm -hmm. of the boron, what it allowed the material to do was ignite at low pressure and sustain. So we used, used the boron as a burn rate additive and, uh, and sustainment material. But uh, yeah, we've done a lot with the metals. Um, Titanium is another interesting metal in these things, but we haven't done that much with it. But uh, yeah, it works. Next question. All right, good. Next question. Are there any indicators of threat countries pursuing these technologies, at least from your vantage point? <laughs> well, um, I don't know. I, you know, there's only so much I, I can find out. You know, I'd actually like to have some. <laughs> if they are, they haven't asked me for any help. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I really don't know uh, the fine. threat countries. The only other country that I'm aware uh, that is doing work in this field, and uh, I certainly would uh, welcome interaction there, is the uh, Indian uh, Space Agency, that they've actually developed some hand-based materials and uh, propellants. And there's just been no interaction there between us. But... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, those are the only other people in the world I know working with hand-based uh, materials. One of the issues is hands not that easy to, to get your hands on and then uh, uh, turn it into the oxidizer you actually need. So there is a, it's, it's not, when you have to use a rotor, uh, rotary evaporator to pull water off, things like that, all of a sudden it gets away from the kind of the garage operations that, you know, mm -hmm. I think people are looking for quick and dirty things. This is more of a, uh, elegant, you know, thing that has to be done right. Not uh, so. Uh, I don't know. Is, is the bottom. Line. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, next question is: What knobs can you turn to tune the ignition time? Primarily, that's going to be power and pressure. When we have a requirement that somebody doesn't want to uh, use a lot of power to ignite a material the option is to put it in a pressurized case and then you can use a small amount of power to ignite the material. And again, the, or, or, or to, to make it light faster with lower power. But again, the mm -hmm. primary knob for ignition time is, uh, is, is power. Next question is, um, so what catalyst were you using for your drop tests? Can GEM operate at lower catalyst preheat temperature than uh, 315E? Yes, uh, it can operate at lower temperatures since uh, we, we've shown that it will ignite at lower temperatures, uh, both on a hot plate and uh, with the only catalyst we've tried. Um, we, we haven't had a lot of access to catalysts since they're so expensive, but uh, a friend of mine at uh, Ultramet who makes a lot of these things uh, had a really nice 
uh, monolithic catalysts that they make. And uh, so we've been testing with the, um, the Ultramet monolithic catalyst and uh, we haven't really tested with others, but uh, we should mm -hmm. expect the same results from the, the hot place tests anyways. Got it. All right, two more questions left. Uh, so has there been, or has, has, has there been any structural or vibrational testing for this? Yeah, we, we had to com do uh, complete vibe testing on our thrusters that we flew in space there. So they, they went through the uh, complete space uh, qualification there. Structural, I'm not sure what you mean by structural, but uh, yeah, we, uh, the solids yeah, can survive, um, the, mm. or did survive all the vibe testing, all that. Nice. All right. Next question. So are the DSSP propellants kinder to rocket nozzles relative to damage, wear, and distortion? I'd say not, um, because we do have higher operating temperatures. So mm. some of the, the the push of that we have in the um, uh, you know there are extra ISP comes from those higher operating temperatures, and that's why uh, even uh, you know the difference between jam and three fifteen is going to be uh, you know the different way you've got to make your uh, combustion chamber. You know one's going to be more expensive if you want that performance. Um, so no, it's not going to be, it's just, it's going to be a hotter material. It's not particularly, um, corrosive or anything like that. The combustion gases that I don't think I, I was able to get to are really benign. So you're not producing any acids, anything like that, but, uh, it would be hotter. Okay. All right. Next question is, uh, in your Hypex material, you mentioned that when energized voids are created. Is that is this damage reversible? Nope, no, it's not. Um, you know, it's once you've sensed you know you've sensitized the material, it's it's ready to go. Um, so no, we can't reverse it. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe got an easy one. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> uh, next question here is: Is there potential for a lead uh, azide replacement? Uh, I'll say maybe. Um, maybe. I know one of the projects we've had in, and I haven't done much on it, was on a, a primer application, but I, I apologize. I really haven't checked with my engineer that's working on that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there actually is uh, some possibilities there. We just haven't spent a lot of time working that direction. All right. All right. And then the next and last question here. Um, I'm going to try to rephrase it here. So um, can it ignite or detonate from compression? And if so, at what pressure or rate of rise? Hopefully I translated that there. Um, no, I don't. Um, you know, we're, we're negative on all the, uh, you know, like the cap tests and things like that. The, the compression, I... High pressure does not cause an explosive to go off. You know, you can confine it and uh, do that. The um, and even on the shock waves, we typically a, a, a hammer drop test uh, that'll be run. And the data is in there that the hammer drop test to get a reaction. You know, typically it's a meter. We built one two meters to to see if we could get some reaction. So uh, no, you're not. I don't see that as. Uh, you know, what, until our material is energized or forms the voids, the you, you need that detonation shock of a detonator to hit it with, not just compression. So I, I hope that answers the question. And we did just get one more that came in, so uh, I lied about that being the last question. Here's the last question, unless pending any other last minute ones to come in. Um, are large scale propulsive devices economically viable relative to composite propellants? You know, I'd say, you know, and, and after all this time, I'd say no, that mm -hmm. these propellants are really specialty propellants. They're for things that you need to turn on and off. You need to tweak one way or another. But just for a big booster or a big boost material like that, there would have to be a, a real specific need for it. Uh, the complexity, you know, most most propellants do one thing, they go push and that kind of thing. But yeah, I'd say you know, scaling up was something that um, we're looking at for use of the material in 
oil or mining or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But big, big boosters are something that I don't think is particularly viable at this time. Okay. All right. And then uh, another one did just come in. That'd be a, an easy yes, no. But is the is the Hypex explosive material a gel, liquid, or solid? It's a, I'll call it a solid. It's a, it, it's, it's not quite gummy bear because of the aluminum in it, but it is a, it, it's a damage tolerance solid. So it's a little bit stiffer than a gummy bear, something like that. But the, the material, the, the, the binder in it has the, the um, characteristics that if it is separated and then it gets, touches again, it will anneal itself. So that's kind of a, unique feature it has but yeah it's more of a solid okay great all right well that was the last question so um without further ado i will say thank you to you wayne for your time the presentation putting it all together for us um thank you to everybody who's stuck stuck it out throughout the whole presentation here and um if there are any follow-up questions i would encourage folks to either reach out to us at dsi and we can help answer them, put you in touch with Wayne, or of course, reach out to Wayne directly. And I believe, to go back, but I believe your contact information was on the, the cover slide. So that's available as well. So thank you, Wayne. Yeah, thank you for hosting me. And uh, I'll get those videos to you. Cause uh, again, the videos are just so cool to just watch how it works. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone have a great day. Take care.